Hi, uh, my name is Bart Weehan. I've read here before, and I'm going to read a couple of um, uh, chapters or parts of chapters from Bill Bryson's novel. Uh, not well, it's a not not a novel. It's a nonfiction book, a history of rooms in a Victorian house that he chose in England. And he looks at the history all the way back from the Middle Ages to modern times and how these rooms uh, were, uh, the history of what people did in these rooms. Um, of course, I chose the bedroom and the bathroom, which I thought were uh, quite interesting. Um, so I'm gonna read a couple uh, pieces from each one. The first one is called the bedroom. The bedroom is a strange place. There is no space within the house where we spend more time doing less and doing it most quietly and unconsciously than here. And yet it is in, it is in the bedroom that many of life's most profound and persistent unhappinesses are played out. If you are dying or unwell, exhausted, sexually dysfunctional, tearful, racked with anxiety, too depressed to face the world, or otherwise lacking in equanimity and joy, the bedroom is the place where you are most likely to be found. It has been thus for centuries, but at just about the time that the Reverend M Mr. Marsham was building his house, an entirely new dimension was added to the life behind the bedroom door. Dread. Never before had people found more ways to be worried in a small confined space than Victorians in their bedrooms. The beds themselves became a particular source of disquiet. Even the cleanest people became a steamy mass of toxins once the lights went out, it seemed. Quote, the water given out in respiration, explained Shirley Forster Murphy in Our Homes and How to Make Them Healthy, 1883, is loaded with animal impurities. It condenses on the inner walls of buildings and trickles down in fetid streams and sinks into the walls, unquote, causing damage of a grave but unspecified nature. Why it didn't cause this damage when it was in one's body in the first place was never explained or evidently considered. It was enough to know that breathing at night was a degenerate practice. Twin beds were advocated for married couples not only to avoid the shameful thrill of accidental contact, but also to reduce the mingling of personal impurities. As one medical authority grimly explained, quote, the air which surrounds the body under the bedclothing is exceedingly impure, being impregnated with the poisonous substances which have escaped through the pores of the skin, unquote. Up to 40% of deaths in America, one doctor estimated, arose from chronic exposure to unwholesome air while sleeping. Beds were hard work, too. Turning and plumping mattresses was a regular chore, and a heavy one, too. A typical feather bed contained 40 pounds of feathers. Pillows and bolsters added about as much again, and all of these had to be emptied out from time to time to let the feathers air, for otherwise they began to stink. Many people kept flocks of geese, which they plucked for fresh bedding, perhaps three times a year, a job that must have been as tiresome for the servants as it was for the geese. A plumped feather bed may have looked divine, but occupants quickly found themselves sinking into a hard, airless fissure between billowy hills. Support was on a lattice of ropes, which could be tightened with a key when they began to sag, hence the expression, sleep tight. But in no degree of tension did they offer much comfort. Spring mattresses, invented in 1865, didn't work reliable at first because the coils would sometimes turn, confronting the occupant with the very real danger of being punctured by his own bed. A popular American book of the 19th century, Good, Good Holmes' Cyclopedia, divided mattress types into 10 levels of comfort in descending order. They were down, most comfortable, feathers, wool, 
wool flock, hair, cotton, wood shavings, sea moss, sawdust, and finally, straw. When wood, when wood shavings and straw make it into a top 10 list of bedding materials, you know you are looking at a rugged age. Mattresses were havens not only for bedbugs, fleas, and moths, which loved old feathers when they could get at them, but for mice and rats as well. The sounds of furtive rustlings beneath the coverlet was an unhappy accompaniment to many a night's sleep. Children who were required to sleep in trundle beds low to the floor were likely to be especially familiar with the whiskery closeness of rats. Wherever people were, were rats. An American named Eliza Ann Summers reported in 1867 how she and her sister took armloads of shoes to bed each night to throw at the rats that ran across the floor. Susanna Augusta Fenimore Cooper, daughter of James Fenimore Cooper, said that she never forgot or indeed, sorry, or indeed ever quite got over the experience of rats scuttling across her childhood bed. Thomas Tryon, author of a book on health and well-being in 18, 1683, complained the, that of the, quote, unclean, fulsome excrement, unquote, of feathers as being attractive to bugs. He suggested fresh straw and lots of it instead. He also believed, with some justification, that feathers tended to be polluted with fecal matter from the stressed and unhappy birds from which they were plucked. Historically, the most basic common filling was straw, whose pricks through the ticking were a celebrated torment. But people often used whatever they could. In Abraham Lincoln's boyhood home, dried corn husks were used, an option that must have been as crunchily noisy as it was an uncomfortable as, as it was uncomfortable. If one couldn't afford feathers, wool and horsehair were cheaper alternatives, but they tended to smell. Wool often became infested with moths too. They, the only certain remedy was to take the wool out and boil it, a tedious process. In poorer homes, Cow dung was sometimes hung from the bedpost in the belief that it deterred moths. In hot climates, summertime insects coming through the windows were a nuisance and hazard. Netting was sometimes draped around beds, but always with a certain uneasiness, as all netting was extremely flammable. A visitor to upstate New York in the 1790s reported how his hosts, in a well-meaning stab at fumigation, filled his room with smoke just before bedtime, leaving him to grope his way through a choking fog to his bed. Wire screens to keep out insects were invented early. Jefferson had them at Monticello, but not widely used because of the expense. For much of history, a bed was, for the most, for the most homeowners, the most valuable thing they owned. In William Shakespeare's day, day a decent canopied bed cost five pounds, half the annual salary of a typical schoolmaster. Because they were such treasured items, the best bed was often kept downstairs, sometimes in the living room, where it could be better shown off to visitors or seen through an open window by passers-by. Generally such, generally such beds were notionally reserved for really important visitors, but in practice were hardly used a fact that adds some perspective to the famous clause in Shakespeare's will in which he left his second best bed to his wife, Anne. This has often been construed as an insult, when in fact the second best bed was almost certainly the marital one, and therefore the one with the most tender associations. Why Shakespeare singled out this, that particular bed for mention is a separate mystery, since Anne would, in the normal course of things, Inherited all, would have inherited all the household beds, but it was by no means the certain, this certain snub that some interpretations have made it. I'm going to stop there with the bedroom because it all, all, all the rest of the chapter involves all sorts of diseases that you can get from being in, in the bedroom with all these funny mattresses uh, that must have been extremely uncomfortable. 
And you can see how lucky we are today with our box springs and beautiful mattresses that go up and down and do everything. Okay, I'm switching now to the bathroom, which is probably, of course, we know bathroom humor and everything. So it, it not, it not, it's not too rude, but uh, it's interesting to see how the bathrooms have evolved from not too long ago until now. So this is the part of the bathroom. I have a couple things here. Uh, it would not be easy to find a statement on hygiene more wrong, or at least more incomplete, than the one by the celebrated architectural critic Lewis Mumford in his classic work, The City in History, published in 1961. This is a quote. For thousands of years, city dwellers put up with defective, often quite vile, sanitary arrangements, wallowing in rubbish and filth. They certainly had the power to remove. For the occasional task of removal could hardly have been more loathsome than walking and breathing in the constant presence of such, or, such ordure. If one had any sufficient explanation to, of this indifference to dirt and order, odor that are repulsive to many animals, even pigs who take pains to keep themselves and their lairs clean, one might also have a clue to the slow and fitful nature of technological improvement itself in the five millennia that followed the birth of the city." End quote. In fact, as we have already seen with Scarabray and Orkney, people have been dealing with dirt, rubbish, and wastes, often surprisingly effectively, for a long time. And Scarabray is by no means unique. A home of 4,500 years ago in, the, in this valley at a place called Mahenyo Daro had a nifty system of rubbish chutes to get waste out of the living area and into the mid a midden. Ancient Babylon had drains and a sewage system. The Minoans had running water, bathtubs, and other civilizing comforts well over 3,500 years ago. In short, cleanliness and generally looking after one's body have been important to a lot of cultures for so long that it is hard to know where to begin. The ancient Greeks were devoted bathers. They loved to get naked. Gymnasium means the naked place. And work up a healthful sweat. And it was, a, it was their habit to conclude their daily workouts with a communal bath. But these were primarily hygienic plunges. For them, bathing was a brisk business, something to be gotten over quickly. Really serious bathing, languorous bathing, starts with Rome. Nobody has ever bathed with as much devotion and precision as the Romans did. The Romans loved water altogether. One house at Pompeii had 30 taps. And their network of aqueducts provided their principal cities with the superabundance of fresh water. The delivery rate to Rome worked out at an intensely lavish 300 gallons per head per day, seven or eight times more than the average Roman needs today. And they are still there today, but they're pouring water, and you can get them in many places in Rome. And you can drink it. To Romans, the baths were more than just a place to get clean. They were a daily refuge, a pastime, a way of life. Roman baths had libraries, shops, exercise rooms, barbers, beauticians, tennis courts, snack bars, and brothels. People from all classes of society used them. Quote, it was common when meeting a man to ask where he bathed, writes Catherine Ashenberg in her sparkling history of cleanliness, the dirt on clean. Some Roman baths were built on, truly, on a truly palatial scale. The great baths of Caracalla could sick, take 1,600 bathers at a time. Those of Diocletian held 3,000. A bathing Roman sloshed and gasped his way through a series of variously heated pools, from the Frigidarium at the cold end of the scale to the Caladarium at the other. En route, he or she would stop at the Unctorium or the Unctuarium to be fragrantly oiled and then forwarded to the, to the Laconium or steam room, where, after the bather worked up a good sweat, the oils were scraped off with an instrument called a strigil 
to remove dirt and other impurities. All this was done in a ritualistic order, though historians are not entirely agreed on what that order was, possibly because the specifics varied from place to place and time to time. There is quite a lot we don't know about Romans and their bathing habits, whether slaves bathed with free citizens, how often or lengthily people bathed, or with what degree of enthusiasm. Romans themselves sometimes expressed disquiet about the state of the water and what they found floating in it, which doesn't suggest that they were all necessarily as keen for a plunge as we generally suppose them to be. It seems, however, that for much of the Roman era, the baths were marked by a certain rigid decorum, which assured a healthy rectitude, but that, as, the, as time went on, life in the baths, as with life in Rome generally, grew increasingly frisky, and it became common for men and women to bathe together, and possibly, but by no means certainly, for females to bathe with male slaves. No one really knows quite what the Romans got up to there, but whatever it was, didn't, it didn't sit well with the early Christians. They viewed Roman baths as licentious and depraved, morally unclean, if not hygienically so. And then it goes on to, again, many uh, diseases that you get from bathrooms and uh, how they clean them up. But if you, if you can imagine what, what London was like uh, in the, um, uh, you know, two or three hundred years ago, how many people, and trying to get rid of, um, uh, 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 and, and, and water, the system. Anyway, I'll continue. Washing for the sake merely of being clean and smelling nice was remarkably slow in coming. When John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, coined the phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness, in a sermon in 1778, he meant cl clean clothes, not a clean body. With respect to bodily cleanliness, he recommended only frequent shaving and foot washing. When the young Karl Marx went off to college in the 1830s, his fretting mother gave him a strict instructions regarding hygiene and particularly enjoined him to have a weekly scrub with sponge and soap. By the time of the great exhibition, things were clearly turning. The exhibition itself featured more than 700 soaps and perfumes, which must have reflected some level of demand. And two years later, cleanliness received another timely boost when the government finally abolished a long, the long-standing soap tax. Even so, as late as 1861, an English doctor could write a book called Baths and How to Take Them. What really got the Victorians to turn to bathing, however, was the realization that it could be gloriously punishing the Victorians had a kind of instinct for self-torment, and water became a perfect way to make that manifest. Many diaries record how people had to break the ice in their wash basins in order to ablute in the morning, and the Reverend Francis Kilvert noted with pleasure how jagged ice clung to the side of his bath and pricked his skin as he merrily bathed on Christmas morning, 1870. Showers, too, had great scope for punishment and were often designed to be as powerful as possible. Only one type of shower was so ferocious that users had to don protective headgear before stepping in, lest they be beaten senseless by their own plumbing. You can imagine, it's probably all very cold, cold showers. Perhaps no other word, this is going on to toilets now, perhaps no other word in English has, gone more, has, had, has undergone more transformations in its lifetime than toilet. Originally, in about 1540, it was a kind of cloth, a, diminution, a diminutive form of toile, a word still used to describe a type of linen. Then it became a cloth for use on dressing tables. Then it became the items on the dressing table, whence toiletries. Then it became the dressing table itself. Then the act of dressing. Then the act of receiving visitors while dressing. Then the dressing room itself. Then any kind of private room near a bedroom. Then a room used lavatorially. And finally, the lavatory itself. Which explains why toilet water in English 
can describe something you would gladly daub on your face, or simultaneously and more basically, water in a toilet. Garderobe, a word now extinct, went through a similar but slightly more compacted transformation, a combination of guard and robe. It first signified a storeroom, then any, pri then any private room, then briefly a bedchamber, and finally a privy. However, the last, things, uh, the last thing privies often were was private. The Romans were particularly attached to the combining of evacuation and conversation. Their public latrines generally had 20 seats or more in intimate proximity, and people used them as unselfconsciously as modern people ride a bus. To answer an inevitable question, a channel of water ran across the floor in front of each row of seats. Users dipped sponges attacked to stick, attached to sticks into the water for purposes of wiping. Being comfortable with strangers lasted far into modern times. Hampton Court contained a great house of ease that could accommodate 14 users at once. Charles II always took two attendants with him when he went into the lavatory. Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, had a lovingly preserved privy with two seats side by side. Sounds like the outhouse. The English, for a long time, were particularly noted for their unconcern about lavatorial privacy. Giacomo Casanova, the Italian adventurer, remarked on a visit to London how frequently he saw someone ease his sluices in full public view along roadsides or against buildings. Pepys notes in his diary how his wife squatted in the road to do her business. Water closet dates from 1755 and originally signified the place where royal enemas were administered. The, ch the English from 1770 called an indoor toilet un lieu à l'anglais, or an English place, which would seem a potential explanation for where the English word loo comes from. At Monticello, Thomas Jefferson installed three private indoor uh, privies, probably the first in America, which incorporated air vents to take the odor away. By Jeffersonian standards, or actually any standards, they weren't technologically advanced. The waste simply fell into a collecting pot, which was emptied by slaves. The Reverend Henry Moule, a vicar in Dorset, invented the earth closet in the mid-19th century. The earth closet was essentially a commode that incorporated a storage tank filled with dry earth. That, with the pull of a handle, released a measured dose of soil into the receptacle, masking the smell and sight of one's leavings. Earth closets were much appreciated for a time, particularly in rural areas, but were swiftly overtaken by flushing toilets, which didn't just cover one's waste, but whisked it away in a torrent of water or at least they did when they worked well, which wasn't always or even often in the early days. Most people used, continued to use chamber pots, which they kept in a cupboard in their bedrooms or closet, and which were known for entirely obscure reasons as Jordans. Foreign visitors were frequently appalled by the English habit of keeping chamber pots in cupboards or sideboards in the dining room which the men would pull out and use as soon as the women had withdrawn. Some rooms came supplied with a necessary chair in the corner as well. A French visitor to Philadelphia, Morose de Saint-Mary, joined with, uh, noted with astonishment how one man removed the flowers from a vase and peed in it. Another French visitor at about the same time reported asking for a chamber pot for his bedroom and being told just to go out the window like everybody else when he insisted on provi being provided with something in which to do his business, the hostess brought, hostess brought him a little kettle, but firmly reminded him that she would need it back in the morning time for breakfast. The most notable feature about anecdotes involving toilet practices is that they always, really always, involve people from one country being appalled by the habits of those from another. There were as many complaints about the lavatorial customs of the French as the French made of others. One that had been around for centuries was that in France there was much pissing in chimneys. 
The French were also commonly accused of relieving themselves on staircases, a practice which was still to be found at Versailles in the 18th century, writes Marc Giraud in Life in the first French Countryside. Life in the French Country House. It was the boast of Versailles that it had 100 bathrooms and 300 commodes, but they were oddly underused, and in 1715, an edict reassured residents and visitors that henceforth the corridors would be cleared of feces weekly. Most sewage went into cesspits, but these were commonly neglected and the contents often seeped into neighboring water supplies. In the worst cases, they overflowed. Samuel Pepys recorded on one occasion in his diary, going down into, quote, going down into my cellar, I put my foot in a great heap of turds, by which I found that Mr. Turner's house of office is full and comes into my cellar with doth trouble me, unquote. The people who cleaned cesspits were known as night soil men. And if there has ever been a less enviable way to make a living, I believe it has yet to be described. They worked in teams of three or four. One man, the most junior, who we may assume, was lowered into the pit itself to scoop waste into buckets. A second stood by the pit to raise and lower the buckets, and the third or fourth carried the buckets to a waiting cart. Night soil work was dangerous as well as disagreeable. Workers ran the risk of asphyxiation and even of explosions, since they worked by the light of a lantern in a powerfully gaseous environment. The Gentleman's Magazine in 1753 related the case of one night soil man who went into a privy vault in a London tavern and was overcome almost at once by the foul air. Quote, he'd called out for help and immediately fell down on his face, one, quote, one, was, one witness reported. A colleague who rushed to the man's aid was similarly overcome. Two more men went to the vault but could not get in because of the foul air. Though they did manage to open the door a little, releasing the worst of the gases, by the time the rescuers were able to haul the two men out, one was dead and the other was beyond help. Because night soil men charged hefty fees, cesspits in poorer districts were seldom emptied and frequently overflowed, not surprisingly, given the pressures put on the average inner city cesspit. Crowding in many London districts was almost unimaginable. In St. Giles, the worst of London's rookeries, seen of William Hogarth's famous engraving, Gin Lane, 54,000 people crowded into just a few streets. By one count, 1,100 people lived in 27 houses along one alley. That is more than 40 people per dwelling. In Spitalfields, farther east, inspectors found 63 people living in a single house. The house had nine beds, one for every seven occupants. A new word of unknown provenance sprang into being to describe such neighborhoods, slum. Charles Dickens was one of the first to use it in a letter of 1851. Right. Into this morass came something that proved unexpectedly to be a disaster, the flush toilet. This is the finish. Flush toilets of a type had been around for some time. The very first was built by John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth. When Harrington demonstrated his invention to her in 1597, she expressed great delight and had one immediately installed in Richmond Palace. But it was a novelty well ahead of its time and almost 200 years passed before Joseph Brama, a cabinet maker and locksmith, patented the first modern flush toilet in 1778. It caught on in a modest way. Many others followed. In America, in 1801, at the White House, or President's House, as it was then called, Thomas Jefferson improved on the odor, on the, on the indoor privies he had installed at Monticello by installing the three of the first flushing toilets to be found in the new nation. They were powered by, a rain, by rainwater cisterns in the attic. But early toilets didn't work well. 
Sometimes they backfired, filling the room with even more of what the horrified owner had very much hoped to be rid of. Until the development of the U-bend and water trap, which create that little reservoir of water that returns to the bottom of the bowl after each flush, every toilet bowl acted as a conduit to the smells of cesspit and sewer. The back waft of odors, particularly in hot weather, could be unbearable. The problem was resolved by one of the great and surely most extraordinarily appropriate names in hygiene history, Thomas Crapper, 1837 to 1910, who was born into a poor family in Yorkshire and reputedly walked to London at the age of 11. There he became an apprentice plumber in Chelsea. Crapper invented the classic and, in Britain, still familiar toilet with an elevated cistern activated by the pull of a chain. Called the Marlborough Silent Water Waste Preventer, it was clean, leak-proof, odor-free, and wonderfully reliable. And its manufacture made Crapper very rich so, and so famous that it is often assumed that he gave his name to the slang term crap and its many derivatives. In fact, crap in the lavatorial sense is very ancient, and crapper for a toilet is an Americanism not recorded by the Oxford English Dictionary before 1922. Crapper's name, it seems, was just a happy coincidence. <laughs>